Okay, hopefully I didn't forget anything in the intro. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's speaker. We have Tracy Weisgerber, who's joining us from the BIH Quest here in Berlin at the Charité. And we always give a little bit of a background to our speakers. So Tracy um, originally studied physiology, worked for some time at the Mayo Clinic in the US and has been at Quest for more than three years now working on meta research topics. She'll talk a bit more about some of her work today. She also is pretty well known for her work in a PLOS biology paper from 2015 that really shifted the paradigm in terms of germ journal policy towards bar plots, uh, something we talk a lot about in epidemiology are our troubles with these bar plots. And this also comes out of the field of neuroscience. And maybe you've heard of some of the initiatives related to barring bar plots for um, specific types of data presentation. So perhaps you've encountered Tracy and didn't even know it before. Now you'll see her here today. We're very, very grateful for your time. Thanks for joining us and please take it away, Tracy. Hey, thank you very much, Jess and Toivo and Chisato for organizing this. I'm just gonna take a minute to share my screen, which I will hopefully not screw up. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see slides now. Um, all right, so today we're going to be talking about tracking shortcuts, which I will argue is possibly great for travel, but not for reproducible method sections. Okay, so as a quick overview, um, I'll talk a little bit about a meta research study that we conducted and how we conducted it, um, the rationale for the study, the methods and the results looking at methodological shortcut citations some of the recommendations that we're proposing as a result of that study. And then if we have a little bit more time at the end, I might go a little bit deeper into solutions in terms of talking about protocol repositories versus protocols journals and the differences between those and why you might use one versus the other. Um, so we all know that the method sections are really fundamental to the reproducibility crisis, because if you don't know what someone did, then it's very hard to reproduce that thing or to evaluate the risk of bias or the quality of the study. And unfortunately, I'm sure all of us has probably encountered situations where we read a paper that we're really excited about and we really want to know what they did and we just can't tell. And so this is a fictional example, um, but many of you may have recognized elements of this from your own experience. So you might be reading a paper that has a protocol and is using a method where they drew an owl. And the first step is we drew some circles and then the rest step is we drew the rest of the owl. And you're like, well, that's great. But with my artistic abilities, I can do the circles. And then I have no idea how we get from the circles to this lovely artistically drawn and very elaborate owl. Um, I don't know what happened in between there. And I definitely could not do that by myself without adult supervision. And if we were to go to the method section of said papers, we might find this very detailed description of the type of paper and the dimensions and the weight of the paper and the location that the pencils were purchased from. Um, but when it comes to the actual part we wanna know about, which is how do we make the owl, it says we did this by looking at the owls and drawing what we saw on paper and this yielded one drawn owl, which is again, completely useless from the perspective of being able to implement this method that we're really excited about in our own lab. So why does this happen? Um, I've listed a number of reasons here and probably all of you are familiar with all of these reasons, but the first reason is word limits. So we all know that there are word limits in most journals and authors are often going to have to make a choice between having lots of words about their results and their discussion and their findings and the significance and the importance of it all versus how they did it. Um, and so authors will often cut works from the methods so that they can have more space in the results and the discussion section to talk about their work. There's also a formatting issue. Methods are written as paragraphs with general verbal descriptions, and that's often much less useful than a real step-by-step -step protocol of exactly what was done and for how long and using what materials, um, which is very, very detailed and is exactly what we need when we're going into the lab. There can also be a personnel mismatch. So the person who is writing the methods may not be the same as the person who is in the lab actually performing the experiment or on the, you know, in the clinical trial center performing the experiment. And that mean, means that important details are missing or left out or may not be accurately presented in the final version of the paper. 
And then there's also an issue of journal requirements. So we know that some journals will actually ask authors to cite previous papers that have used a method rather than re-describing methods that have already been published elsewhere. So you might be wondering, well, okay, but do I really need to know the full details of all of the methods? Do I really, really want that detailed protocol? Isn't it just going to get in my way um, when I'm trying to figure out what the study is and what was done and why? And I think it's important to remember that we have lots of different readers and the different readers have different needs. So everybody needs to understand the overall study design and have an overview of methods were used to answer the research question. And everybody needs to have information that's needed to assess scientific rigor as well as the risk of bias. And because everyone needs these things, we would hope that they are most often being reported in the method section, although we know that that's not always the case. When it comes down to the details of that are needed to reproduce the experiments or recreate the method elsewhere, only some readers are going to need that information. But the fact that this category is smaller doesn't make it less important. Um, because the readers that really need the details about how to reproduce your methods are going to be the one that are, ones that are implementing those methods and carrying them on in their own research and doing future work in this area. And one of the people that's most certainly included in that category is future you. And so these readers are going to require a lot of detail, and sometimes that detail isn't going to fit within the method section of the paper, and it may need to go elsewhere, like in a protocol repository or a protocol journal. So you might be wondering, why can't I just cite previous papers that describe the methods? And what's the problem when I use something called a methodological shortcut citation? Let's first off start by talking about what a methodological shortcut citation are. Um, so a methodological shortcut citation occurs when instead of describing methods in details, the authors cite a previous paper that used similar methods. So essentially you are using a citation to replace a portion of your method section. And as important context, we should remember that some journals actually ask or requires authors to use, to use shortcut citations if methods that are similar to theirs have been described previously, and there are also scientists who consider this to be best practice. However, we also know that there are scientists who've had problems finding detailed methods from shortcut citations and worry that this use of shortcuts instead of writing out the methods in detail is negatively affecting our ability to reproduce or implement methods that others have used. So in theory, um, we, if we were thinking about the ideal case of someone using a shortcut citation, we might expect the authors to cite a recent state of the art methods paper, uh, or perhaps an original research article that has a very detailed description of the study methods. We would hope that the methods that the authors used are very similar or identical to those that were used in the shortcut citation. And we would want the authors to clearly explain any modifications that they made to that method that they cited, which is replacing their method section. In practice, we know that there are lots of stories, and perhaps some of you have stories yourselves, of readers who've tried to follow shortcut citations or look into shortcut citations and had problems getting the information they needed to reproduce the author's methods. And here are a couple of examples of people who've had problems doing this, courtesy of Twitter and the internet specifically. And so the first one is someone who is looking for a protocol in a 1997 paper, and the, there was a shortcut citation that says, as previously described in 1996. So they went to that paper as previously described in 1987, and then the 87 paper was paywalled, so they couldn't get the information about the methods. And then we have a second person who's done something similar. Devices were fabricated as previously described and they find that going back three different citations. And when they finally get to the end, it says devices were fabricated with conventional methods. And there's no information that would help one to fabricate whatever devices they want to make. So they are out of luck and have wasted a lot of time. So in order to look at this issue of citation shortcuts, we did a three-part study of three fields and we focused on neuroscience, psychiatry, um, and we had three different parts to the study. So in the first part, we wanted to know why do authors use citations in the method sections of papers and how often are authors using shortcut citations? 
The second study was a case series. So we focused on what happens when we follow shortcut citations to find information needed to reproduce the method. And then the third part that I won't talk about today is the journal policy studies, where we went into policies for all of the journals in our three fields of interest, neuroscience, psychiatry, and biology. And we looked at what proportion of journals were asking authors to provide enough methodological detail to allow others to reproduce the experiment, to use shortcut type citations, or to share detailed methods in supplemental files, protocol repositories, or elsewhere. And I think it's important to note that this was a lot of work, and it was not all done by me. In fact, I did a very small part of it. Um, so this study was actually completed by early career researchers as part of the meta research course that I run through the Berlin University Alliance. And this is a participant guided learn by doing course where participants in all different fields across the four different Berlin universities sign up. Um, most of whom have never heard of meta research when they come into the course. And they learn about meta research by working together to design, conduct, and publish a meta research study. So I think it's really important for everyone to understand that these were all students who worked very hard on the study during the pandemic from June to December of 2020 when things were very challenging. Um, and they put a lot of work in. Um, so I just would like everyone to recognize that as we go forward. Okay, so let's talk first about the prevalence study and I'll mention briefly our study design. So the sampling frame, we looked at all full length original research papers that were published in the top 15 biology journals or the top 20 uh, neuroscience and psychiatry journals ranked according to impact factor and we did limit it to top journals that published original research. We, in terms of outcomes, were looking at each citations in the method section of the paper. And we examined those citations in the method section to determine why the resource was cited, whether citations used to explain a method were probable or possible shortcuts. And I'll explain what that means in a minute. The number of resources cited per shortcut and the age of resources cited in shortcuts. And unfortunately, we did not have the scope to also examine methods or resources that were cited in supplemental method sections. And then all steps were completed by two independent reviewers for verification. So one of the first things we found is that we actually use citations in the method section quite frequently. So if you look at the median for our three fields, it's around 9 to 11 citations that are appearing in the method section of published papers. However, we also see a pretty long tail to this distribution. So there are certainly papers that have 30 or 40 or 50 citations. And a couple of our students were swearing loudly um, over our internet forum because they happened to get papers that had more than 140 <laughs> citations and they had to review all of them. So that was a pretty terrible day for them. Okay, so... Um, one of our research questions was why do authors use citations in the method sections of papers? Sorry about that, my computer is trying to do an update of some sort and I just need to kill that before it ruins everything. Okay, so reasons why authors do citations in the method section. There were six particular categories that we were interested in um, and I've organized them by, by question words to make this easy. So the first one is how citations and these are simply citations that are designed to explain a method. So to explain how something was done. There are also who or what citations, and these are designed to give credit to someone or to specify what material or what thing or what method was used. There are from whom citations, and this is to specify a source of data or materials. So I got this animal or I got this antibody from this lab or this person. And there are why citations, and these are used to provide context or justification. So we use this procedure because it has previously been shown to work better in this patient population. Um, we also captured some citations that would give a particular formula or value. And there was also an other category for rare instances that didn't fit into one of the first citations. And one of the things that's going to be important to recognize going forward is that how citations can be methodological shortcut citations. So it's the how citations to explain a method that are really the things that can where we're using a citation to replace part of our method sections. The remaining categories are not shortcuts. 
Okay, so citations in the methods section most often describes how, who, or what, and why. So this is a very fancy graph. Um, you can see the neuroscience articles are in yellow, the biology articles are in blue, and the psychiatry articles are in red. And you see every citation that we looked at here. And if we look at the how citations for explaining a methods, we can see that that was approximately half of citations in the methods section for neuroscience and psychiatry papers, and about a third for biology. The who or what citations range between 12% and 41%, depending on the field, and were perhaps a bit more common in biology compared to the other fields. And then the why citations for context or justification were occurring in 19 to 25% of papers. And we didn't see very much, uh, very many citations in the from whom the formula or value or the other categories of methodological citations. So as I mentioned, um, it's the how citations that are really potentially or most likely to be shortcut citations. Um, and so while some of the methods or these citations that we're seeing in the methods section are certainly shortcuts, others may not be. Okay. So let's talk about the shortcut citations. So what we did was we took all of the how citations and we divided them into three different levels to reflect the likelihood that the citation was a shortcut. And some of you, I presume, are in epidemiology, so you will recognize the strategy of defining something as a probable shortcut, possible shortcut, or definitely not a shortcut. Um, so the intent here for a probable shortcut was to designate that a reader would most certainly need to consult the shortcut citation to obtain information needed to reproduce the method, whereas a possible shortcut is a little bit less certain. So a reader might need to consult the shortcut citation to obtain need de details needed to reproduce the method. However, they may not. Um, and then the not a shortcut level simply indicated that all of the information was contained within the sentence. And this was most often used for things that had a very specific parameter or value or settings where everything was contained within that one sentence. The reality is that these things were rather hard to operationalize. Um, it's very difficult to determine without knowing the exact method, whether or not someone would need to consult a resource to obtain more information about that methods, and that can also depend on the, the reader's expertise with that method. And so because of that, we ended up having to use a syntactic definition for data abstraction. So for the probable shortcut, we defined a probable shortcut as no additional detail was provided beyond the sentence containing the shortcut citation. And then the possible cite shortcut we defined as some detail is provided beyond the sentence with a shortcut citation. Um, so this might include an example, as an example, for a possible shortcut, we use the method described by so-and-so, and, -so, and um, briefly, we did it this way in providing some details. Okay, what we found was that methodological shortcut citations are common. So here you can see probable shortcuts on the right and possible shortcuts on the left. And the total number of shortcuts would be the sum of possible plus probable citations. And you can see that there are approximately one to three for a median value. Um, for each probable and possible shortcuts in each field. And again, some papers certainly are using shortcut citations much more often than others. And so there is definitely a long tail with the distributions in all of these three fields. We also looked at the idea of how old these shortcut citations were. Um, so we know that some citations are, you know, methods in some fields evolve more quickly than in others. In some fields, older methods are still fine and they're widely used. Um, in other fields, methods evolve very quickly and something that's three or five or 10 years old may be quite out of date. So when we looked at the age of shortcut citations, we have here both the oldest shortcut or the oldest paper that was cited as a shortcut um, and the newest paper that was cited as a shortcut within each paper. And our medians here, again, are around 10, 15 years, um, depending on whether you're looking at the oldest or the newest citations. So this is suggesting that some methods, well, may be still state of, or some shortcut citations may be referring still to state of the art methods. Others may be referring to things that are no longer state of the art. 
We also found that while many methods or many papers were reporting additional methods in the supplement, few papers were using repositories. So we found between 55 and 59% had some information in the supplement. Um, we didn't collect data on this. However, subjectively speaking, this information was often not detailed. It often might be as simple as a table containing a list of primers or um, patient demographic characteristics. It was much less likely to be a really detailed description of additional methods that the authors have used. And then for methods repositories, we found that between 9 and 16% of papers were putting methods in repositories and citing them in their paper, depending on the field. Um, we did count analysis code as a method because it is a method used to analyze your data. So the most common repository by far was GitHub. Um, the second most common was clinicaltrials.gov. And then less common things would include things like Data Dryad, Figshare, OSF. Okay, so for the case series studies, we used a sample of 15 papers and there were five per field. And we had one in each paper of, one paper per field in each quintile for the number of possible and probable shortcut citations per field, which is a lot of words. Um, it's much less complicated than it sounds. Anyway, from a randomly generated list of 15 papers, and then that was again, one paper per field per quintile, we took the first paper on the list in which a class member had expertise in the study. Um, so because we were following shortcut citations in detail, we did need reviewers who kind of knew what they were looking at. And so we had to, um, instead of picking at random, making sure that we had a randomly generated list, but we did go for the first item on the list that we had someone with expertise in the methods discussed. And for this protocol, e reviewers followed each shortcut citation backwards until they found a description of the method or they reached a dead end. Um, and what this showed us was that while shortcut citations can be used effectively, they can also create problems for people who want information about the methods. And when we saw problems, those problems generally fell into one of five categories. So the first problem we found was problems locating the citation. Um, so basically, they couldn't verify that this material in fact existed. And that could be due to things like an incorrect author name, year or DOI, a dead website link or 404 error, or a book version that was no longer in print. If they were able to verify that the citation existed, they may have some problems accessing the citation. So this could include paywalls, older articles with no PDFs available, or not having access to a book, um, a diagnostic questionnaire, or another resource. And because this was done during the pandemic, we did not allow students to go to the library. They had to be able to find things online. The third issue that we had was problems finding the cited method. Um, so the method may not have been mentioned. There may have been a book chapter with no pages specified. It was just somewhere in a 400 page book that they were supposed to find where this method was, or the resource may have been in a different language. And then the next problem we had was an insufficient description of the method that was cited. So perhaps the method wasn't really described in detail or the description didn't offer any additional information beyond what was provided in the paper that had cited it. The description may no longer be state of the art, or the authors found that there was a shortcut citation instead of a methods description. And that leads us to our fifth problem. Um, if there was a shortcut citation, then the authors had to go through this entire again with the next shortcut citation in the chain, which takes a lot of time and makes everyone unhappy. Okay, so before we get into the implications of this data, I think it's important to talk a little bit about the limitations. Um, and there are two main ones that I want to raise today. The first one is that the data examining the reasons for citing a paper in the method section should be viewed as an approximation. So many of you are aware that we actually don't give scientists very much training in how to cite papers. And so the abstractors were making distinctions that the authors themselves didn't make when they were writing the paper about the reasons why something might be cited. And because of that, small changes in the language of the sentence or the position of the reference within the sentence could alter the categorization 
and variations in reader expertise could also influence the categorization. Um, so for example, if something is cited at the end of the sentence, you tend to assume that it's the, the entire content of the sentence is being cited. Whereas if it appears after a particular antibody or a mouse, then you might assume that it's referring to that thing um, in that, you know, that item that was used as one example. And there are certainly other things. Um, so I would just encourage people to understand that this protocol is actually quite difficult to implement, and there will be some variability between abstractors that we simply cannot eliminate. And then also, as I mentioned before, that the probable and possible shortcuts were defined using syntactic definitions because the conceptual definitions weren't feasible as they were too dependent on reviewers' familiarity with the subject of the paper. Okay, so summary of what we found. Um, first, citations are often used in method section, and the most common reasons for citing methods or citing papers in the method sections were to describe how, who, or what, and why. That not all methodological citations are shortcuts, but shortcut citations are very common. Um, shortcut citations include papers that may no longer be state of the art or may be older, and while shortcut citations can be used effectively, they can also create problems for readers who want detailed information about the study methods. So as I go forward and talk about solutions, I'm going to ask you to remember here is that my premise is that shortcut citations are designed to replace a section of the methods. And therefore, when we're using shortcuts, we should ensure that they meet additional standards that are not necessary for other types of citations. Okay, so um, things that I think we should be thinking about as a result of this data. The first one is when is it appropriate to use a shortcut citation? So I would argue that there are three conditions that we should be meeting. The first is that the cited resource contains a very detailed description of the method. So someone else should be able to find enough details in that cited resource to implement the method themselves. The second is that the method you used is very similar or identical to the method described in the shortcut citation to the point where any modifications can be briefly described in the method section of your paper. And the third is that the cited resource is open access. And you might be wondering, well, is open access really that important? I mean, what if I have the perfect paper that describes my methods completely, but it's not open access? Why is that such a big deal? Um, I would argue that it is a really big deal because, again, knowing how the methods are performed is essential for reproducibility. And unfortunately, if we have shortcut citations that are behind paywalls or aren't accessible, then we are systematically depriving some readers of information about how our methods were performed. And this burden is going to fall more disproportionately on those with limited access to publications. Um, and I'd like to remind everyone that while this affects researchers in countries with limited research funding, it also affects people in institutions that are very well funded um, and in areas that have a lot of research funding. And as we're all in Germany, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the Elsevier issue that we no longer have access to many journals because of the contract disputes with Elsevier. So this is not a theoretical problem. Um, so again, my contention here is that the shortcut citations should meet higher standards like open access because they provide crucial information about how the experiment is performed and that's essential for reproducibility. Okay, so you might be wondering what if the resource that I want to cite doesn't happen to meet these conditions? Well, I would argue that there are a few steps you can take. Um, the first thing is it doesn't mean you can't cite the resource. You can still cite the resource, but do so to give credit to its authors instead of using it as a shortcut citation to, re to replace a section of your methods. And that means if you're citing something to give credit and it's not as a shortcut that you need to have another way of describing your methods. So if you can, you may want to describe the method in detail in the text of your paper, if you can do that without going to the supplemental files. Um, however, it's important to remember that 
even for short protocols or simple methods, protocol repositories can be more effective because again, they are step-by-step -step detailed information and they're not written in a paragraph format that tends to provide more of a general overview while omitting potentially relevant details that are deemed unnecessary when we're publishing a paper. And the other thing is that repositories make protocols easier to find, version, and fork. And I'll talk about what this means in a minute. So, and if you don't feel that you can adequately describe the method, then you may want to deposit a protocol in a rep protocol repository and then cite that protocol, which is much more detailed as your shortcut citation. So essentially you create your own shortcut citation. Okay, so I mentioned that ideally you would want to be able to describe things in the text and not have to go to the supplemental files. Why is it? What's the problem with methods in the supplement? There are a number of problems. Um, the first problem is that having access to the supplement doesn't mean having access to the paper and vice versa. So there are publishers that offer free access to supplements, others don't. So you have to have a subscription to get the supplement. And if you don't, no supplement for you. Um, it's also important to remember that when we think about some of the ways that we use to get, get access to journals that we don't have subscriptions to, um, many of those ways may not provide the supplement along with it. So if you think about interlibrary loan or article repositories, sometimes the supplemental files are there, sometimes they're not. The next problem is that implementation or information contained in supplements isn't findable. So if I go to a protocol repository and I search for protocols on Western blots or ultrasound procedures for measuring vascular function, I will get a list of things. There's no way to search for that in papers and in the supplements. Some papers may have detailed methods, many won't. I'm going to have to go through a huge amount of papers in order to find one that has a really detailed methods protocol, which is what I'm looking for. Um, the other point that I've mentioned before is that supplemental methods are again typically text versions. They're not detailed protocols, they're textual summaries in general. And the last thing is that supplemental files are static documents that cannot be versioned or forked. So I've mentioned versioning and forking a couple times. Let's just make sure that everyone knows what these are. Versioning is you when you create a new or updated or adapted version of your own protocol. So you say, okay, two years ago I was doing this, I've changed some things, now I'm doing this, here is the new version of my protocol. Forking is exactly the same. It's just when you do that with a protocol that was originally created by someone else. So if Jess poses a protocol and I say, oh, I like this protocol, I wanna use it for my study, um, but I'm gonna to have to change some things because I have some different equipment or I'm working with a different patient population. So here's my version of what Jess is doing. And versioned and forked protocols can be linked to the original. So I can say, okay, I base my fork protocol on Jess's original protocol. So she gets credit for developing the protocol, but I still tell everyone exactly what I'm doing in my study. And then this process of versioning and forking makes it easier to find and to track the evolution or to find the origin of methods and then to track how they're evolving over time. And it also gives credit to the person who posted the original protocol from which other protocols were developed. Okay, so best practices for using shortcut citations. Um, I would argue that there are three things that we should think, be thinking about here. The first is to make sure that the citation meets the three criteria that we talked about previously. And so when we're talking about a detailed description, protocols, methods, papers, or video protocols are ideal. Um, original research papers may still be beneficial if they describe the method in sufficient detail to replicate the uh, method. We also want to make sure that we're describing modifications. So when you are using a shortcut, you should say, this is how what I did differed from what they did. And you may want to version or FERC protocols to show your exact changes. And then the other thing that's really important is to provide the exact location of cited methods. Um, so don't make someone read a 400 page book or manual to figure out what you did. Just tell people like it's on page 22, paragraph three. Um, everyone will thank you. No one has time to read through 400 pages of stuff looking for something that might describe what it is that you did. So a visual summary, you first want to start out by asking, is there a resource available that describes a method similar to one that you used so that you can quickly describe any modifications in the text that gives others enough detail to reproduce the experiment and its open access? 
If there is, you would want to cite the resource as a shortcut and make sure that your citation gives information so that readers know exactly where to look in that resource to find the methods and that you've clearly described all modifications of in your own method section, possibly using versioning or hooked protocols. If there is no resource available, then you might want to cite the resource to give credit since your work was based on the method that they developed and then create your own citation shortcut by depositing your protocol in a repository or publishing a methods paper. Okay, so what do you do if no shortcut citation is available and the method is too complex to describe in the text? Where might you put your protocol? There are three main options. The first one, and probably the most common and popular, is the supplemental methods. And this one, I think we should think about avoiding for the reasons that I talked about previously. The other options are protocol journals and protocol repositories. So what's the difference between a protocol journal and a protocol repository? And why would I choose one over the other? Um, the main difference here, I think, is that protocol repositories allow you to share living protocols, whereas protocol journals are static. They reflect what one lab is doing at one point in time. And that may be okay if you are working in a field where things don't really evolve or adapt or update, but many of us are not. Um, epidemiological cohort studies may be an example of something that actually doesn't change and so this may be a little bit different for this particular audience. But in more detail, protocol journals for a lab audience might include things like bioprotocol.org, um, nature protocols or the current protocols in series or the journal of visualized experiments, whereas repositories includes things like protocols.io and protocols exchange. Um, can also include things like clinicaltrials.gov for more study design related things. Um, protocol journals are static, so they reflect what a single lab is doing at one point in time. And this means that they're often used for new methods that are highly innovative that the journals want credit for. If you are in an area where methods evolve quickly, then protocol journal publications can very quickly become obsolete. And so you may find that you know, you've published something and you keep citing it for 10 years, even though what you're doing now is completely different or quite different from what you were doing at the time you cited it. And with a protocol journal, because it's static and there's no burgeoning or forking, you also can't track protocol deviations. And so it really is the responsibility of authors who are citing that method to describe how they've done it differently. The protocol journals publications are peer reviewed. They require a lot of effort. Um, and again, that often means that we only do these, we, we're more likely to use these things for new innovative methods that we really want credit for. Repositories allow us to more quickly create living versions of the protocol. So it's fast to share an updated version um, of your own protocol or to fork someone else's protocol to describe your variations and to link those back to the original to give the original creator credit. And there are also options for creating collections of similar protocols. And protocol repositories are most advantageous when they provide the capacity to version and fork. They are not peer reviewed. However, some protocol repositories do have features that allow you to check citations, versioning, and forking of posted protocols. Um, so for example, protocol I, protocols IO has a works for me button and you can see how many people have clicked on work for me. And generally speaking, the level of effort required is much lower than we'd be required for a protocol journal publication. So you might be wondering, Hmm, these things both sounded nice and they both have advantages. How can I get the best of both worlds? Um, Plus One has a new article type that allows you to do this. So you can publish a methods article called a lab protocol. And that protocol is basically a short introduction to your protocol on Protocols.io that provides context. They also potentially more relevant for this audience offer a study protocol version where authors can upload their protocol and they do expedite review for studies that have undergone peer review, either by a funding agency grant mechanism or through ethics approval. So that's potentially something to think about. I think the benefits are stronger for lab people just because of the link to protocols IO and the ability to create a um, living version of your protocol that can be versioned and forked while also getting a publication credit for it. So you might be wondering, this 
depositing protocols thing sounds like it takes time. I have no time. Um, so why should I do this and how is it going to benefit me? There are several ways that it can benefit you. The first is in tracking changes as the study evolves. Um, the next thing is it's helpful for you when you're looking back to determine what protocol was used for a particular experiment. So we often go back to our methods and while you remember exactly what you were doing in great detail right now, three months from now or two years from now or five years from now, you may think, yeah, I know I did some stuff, but I have no idea what it is that I did. Um, and I really don't know. Whereas if you have a, a protocol cited, then it'll come with a version number and you know exactly what you're doing then and how it's different from what you're doing now. Depositing protocols also allows you to obtain long-term access. Even if you haven't used the protocol in many years, which happens to lots of us who stay in science, we think, oh, I did that thing five years ago that was interesting or 10 years ago, or maybe 15 years ago. Um, it's on paper somewhere. I have no idea where it is. The person who's doing it has left the lab. I don't know what's going on anymore. I really would like to have that. Where is it? Well, if it's deposited in a repository, it's easy for you to find and it's easy for everyone else to find. And so you'll be able to find stuff if you haven't used in a while, if the person responsible has moved on or left the lab, or if you move your lab to another institution. And then it also makes it easier for others to use and cite your protocol, which allows you to potentially establish collaborations with others who are developing and building on your methods. Um, just a couple final points. So some scientists believe that you should always cite the first paper to use a method, whereas others think that you should cite a more recent papers that uses methods that are more similar to your own. Who is right? Everyone is right. Um, so these two beliefs reflect different reasons for citing a paper. So when we're talking about citing the first paper that used a method to give the authors credit, this is a credit citation. When we're talking about citing a recent paper that's more similar to what we did, this is a shortcut citation. Um, so what do you do? Well, you can do both. And if you're doing both, then it's helpful to write your sentence in a way that helps readers to distinguish what's the credit citation and what's the shortcut citation, so they know exactly what you did and who you want to give credit to for helping you along the way. So here's an example. I might write the sentence experiments were formed using an updated version of citation one of the protocol originally developed by Smith and colleagues. So originally developed by tells me that this is a credit citation and I'm giving credit to the original author. And the experiments were performed using an updated version of tells me that this is the shortcut citation and that these are the methods that are more similar to the ones I'm using. Okay. So here we have a big Perry decision tree. It's in very small text and maybe difficult for you to read. So I'm going to walk through it as fast as possible um, just to make it extra confusing. So first decision, has the method been described before? If the answer is no, if it's simple, you might be able to describe it in the text. If not, you need to ideally um, either put it in a protocol journal, put it on a repository, do a methods paper, do something to create your own you know, citation shortcut for future use that really gives others the details needed to reproduce that experiment. If your method has been described before, then you might want to next look and see whether a version of the protocol is available on a repository that allows versioning and forking. If it is, version or fork and cite your protocol as the shortcut, and you may want to cite the original to give credit. If there is no version available on a repository that allows versioning and forking, then you might want to look at whether there is a resource describing the method similar to those that you use that meets the three criteria for shortcut citations. If there is, you can cite the resource as a shortcut. Um, you want to make sure that the citation allows readers to find the actual location of the methods and that you've described all modifications. If there is no shortcut that's eligible, then you might want to ask yourself whether there's a resource available that doesn't meet the criteria for citation shortcuts, but might still help readers in implementing the method. If yes, you could cite the resource to give credit and then create your own shortcut citation by depositing a method in a repository or publishing a methods paper. And if no, then you might simply want to create your own shortcut um, by, again, depositing the method in a protocol repository or publishing a methods paper. So basically, publishing your methods in a repository or as a paper is good and you should do this more often. Okay, 
So um, that is all. I'm happy to welcome question, comments, and emotional outbursts. Thank you so much, Tracy, uh, first of all. And we will stop the recording now to facilitate some lively discussion.